thin. It says something about the, may the legions protect you or something about, and it all turns into, people get all spun up about its secret Satan worshiping talk and its devil worshiping talk. And it's really the legions of Lucifer. And when he says seven lights, it's a reference to the, okay, it's time to tell you that's all kooky too. I mean, it's okay if you believe all that. Um, um, if you work, if you speak in that context yourselves, but you have to understand we're all not secretly in that world. Okay, when Mike Flynn and I talk, we're not secretly bearing satanic messages in our communications. Uh, 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 it's, and the fact that he gets picked apart for this kind of stuff, it's just silly. And it's way too time consuming. We have, he has real work to do without giving interviews and addressing this. It's silly to be asking a guy like Mike Flynn to be addressing that. Sorry you don't know it, willing to tolerate it until now I'm now laying it on the line I think the people who are who do that kind of stuff are silly you're silly you're kooks you're like Lynn Wood thinking that when Joe Flynn says well good luck to you your best of luck to you and your family David that that's really a secret code for I'm gonna kill you and your family so <laughs>
uh, comrade and friend, uh, Paul Prescott, uh, who is running for state Senate in Pennsylvania. You also know his work um, from the Jackman Show and from Jackman Magazine. I'm really excited to talk to Paul. Um, not only is his campaign really inspiring, he's one of those guys who is a really deep thinker, but also does the damn work. Um, so he'll have a lot of insights for us. And a little bit later in the show, uh, we're going to be talking about the inflation swindle. I mean, there's a lot that goes into talking about inflation and what that means uh, for the country. Uh, but I think it's really important that, you know, as a program that's sort of oriented toward looking to what this means for working class people, we understand the political games that are at work uh, and, and why you should start to get a little bit worried when you start to hear um you know, even even liberal po politicians start talking about, you know, the rise of inflation, what that really means and how that's going to affect us in the future. Yeah, I mean, you really get a sense that the big inflation that they're concerned about and of course, all the inflation they're concerned about, but is wage inflation mm -hmm. like that's um, <laughs> the cynical. It's like when we're talking when people's concerns uh, aren't there, there people are saying the same word like when Henry Kissinger says democracy, he doesn't mean democracy. But anyway, uh, we'll get no, yeah, that. I mean, and even beyond that, like. It's just a great way for them to avoid having political conversations about political issues. I and mean, that's really what it's about. Right. But we'll get to that soon. Um, but before we get there, we want to talk a little bit of good news in Honduras. Yeah. So, I mean, just to set the context, I've been uh, um, brushing up on my uh, Manuel Zelaya coup. Uh, this is mm -hmm. uh, a really disgraceful uh, chapter in the Barack Obama presidency. Uh, where we, we call Joe Biden the press release president. Uh, mm -hmm. We have a situation here where uh, uh, Obama initially said, like, yeah, we think that's a coup. And Hillary's like, but we don't want to uh, actually say that because of X reasons. I have this section from uh, the tricontinental.org. And, and just to, to put the uh, 2009 elections, uh, uh, put the, the recent victories of um, of Jamara Castro, um, who was the first uh, lady to uh, Zelaya, um, in the context of those 2009 elections. So Zelaya mm -hmm. proposed that in addition to voting for a new president, Congress, and municipal officials, the electorate also vote for a national constituent assembly on the fourth ballot. However, he wanted to leave the question of whether or not there should be a fourth ballot to the Honduran people. Uh, and none, and so like we have a complete freak out because uh, we want to change the way that uh, from when like the Reagan administration and uh, partners decided this is the way we're running our, our government. So... The United Nations General Assembly condemned the coup, and so did U.S. President Barack Obama, although Obama's Secretary of State Hillary Clinton contradicted him immediately. And uh, should we play that clip now of uh, Hillary yeah. sort of discussing, uh, and this is, I think, when she was still Secretary of State, and I think well, uh, in run-up to the, her failed bid for presidency. Actually, just like this, I mean, just as a little bit of an addition, because you know, I think some people like know it's happened in Honduras and, and, and other folks uh, might not. I mean, you know, this is a country that the United States has been heavily involved in uh, for decades. Um, and, and Zelaya was an interesting uh, character. I mean, um, he ends up being targeted uh, by the United States and becoming someone who's a big thorn in their side, primarily because of his pursuit, as you would guess, of, you know, some positive social programs, as Matt was sort of noting as well, some kind of political reforms in the country, uh, but also because of the fact that this was somebody who had, you know, fairly friendly relations with Cuba and Venezuela. And when we're talking about the, you know, the incoming Castro government, that's already uh, what the United States is all worked up about is about how they're going to be interacting um, with people who you know are, are are their neighbors in that part of the world right um so um oh yeah and then uh, you know and on top of it Zelaya is an interesting character too because i mean this is like a fairly well-off businessman right um who ends up um you know who and for most of his sort of like political statements and involvement beforehand you know did not particularly seem like uh, any kind of you know hardcore radical um but when he comes into to office that that position does significantly start to change um uh, and then you start to see much more american interest in sort of um you know, kicking him out of office. And anyways, we have this clip here yeah. of, of Hillary. Yeah. I, he realizes that uh, yeah, the capitalists are basically an obstacle to democracy. And that, that's a good point. I, I, I don't <laughs> want to skip over what he, his actual uh, policies were. So Zelaya's government introduced free public education for children, a higher minimum wage, a range of social welfare policies, including cash transfers and free electricity. Uh, and uh, Berta Carceres, a leader and co-founder of the Council of People, uh, of popular and indigenous organizations who's assassinated um, in part for this uh, uh, with people, the ruling class complicit in this coup. 
Mm-hmm. But Carcer has said about this, uh, why the coup took place? Because the rich, the oligarchs, the far right, with support from the mafia from Miami and Cuban and Venezuela counter revolution, these are the consultants of these coup supporters. Their worries that the Honduran people could decide what to do with the strategic resources like water, the forests, the land, our sovereignty with our labor rights, the minimum wage, women's rights, constitutional rights, the self determination of black and indigenous people. So many things that we as Honduran people dream of, the possibility of having an inclusive, democratic, equitable state and society with direct participation of the people. The coup supporting oligarchs know all of this. That is why there was a coup. Uh, yeah. And this coup is against all the processes of liberation on our continent. I think that's exactly. I mean, there were just significant shifts that were happening in the country. Um, and, you know, I mean, Zelaya's kind of movement as well is, I don't know, a kind of interesting crash course. And I think what a, a lot of people realize when they come into state power is that there are all these other kind of actors that hold, you know, immense power in society um and, and you know and so I, unlike many other people who come into power decided he wanted to sort of confront those powers instead of play a uh, ball with them but we have a lot more to talk about with hunters let's play this uh, clip with hillary clinton on democracy now sort of being challenged uh and yeah be interesting to parse this because she's kind of buys in if we can uh, bring it up like she really accepts the lawfare of it. She just has a problem with the optics. Mm-hmm. Do you have any concerns about the role that you play uh, in that particular situation, even not necessarily being in agreement with your top aides and state Well, let me again try to put this in context. Um, the legislature, or the, the, the national legislature in Honduras and the national judiciary actually followed the law in removing President Zelaya. Now, I didn't like the way it looked or the way they did it, but they had a very strong argument that they had followed the Constitution and the legal precedents. And as you know, they really undercut their argument by spiriting him out of the country in his pajamas, where they sent, you know, the military to, you know, take him out of his bed and get him out of the country. So this was this began as a very uh, you know, mixed and difficult situation. If the United States government declares a coup, you immediately have to shut off all aid, including humanitarian aid. <laughs> Um, the Agency for International Development aid, uh, the support that we were providing at that time for a lot of very poor people. And that triggers a legal necessity. There's no way to get around it. So our assessment was we will just make the situation worse by punishing the Honduran people if we declare a coup and we immediately have to stop all aid for uh, yeah. the people, but we should stand and, and try to stop anything that the government. And you also wouldn't get to uh, get the bite at the apple for privatizing healthcare and education, uh, <laughs> right? I mean, it's it's amazing uh, the moments when the United States starts to get worried about the restraint, um, its ability to provide humanitarian aid to countries, right? Um, while, while it's like actively right. trying to prevent, for example, today Venezuela from <laughs> being able to trade on international markets or um, import food into the country. I mean, yeah, it's uh, it's it's next level stuff. So. This was a really um, historic repudiation, though, and I think that like the next decade um, was a decade of of severe instability and horror in the country. Um, you know, you had Kamala Harris going on recently about how they're going to get to the root causes of why there's so much immigration from Honduras. I mean, this right here, this coup uh, with implicit American support, um, played a big role in uh, in destabilizing uh, the country. So, this election was 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 a huge one, not only because. Um, you know, uh, Castro comes into power, uh, but also you had 70% of the population voting, which is incredible. Um, she ran on a, a socialist platform. She actually became the first woman president of the country. Um, and, you know, while running on, you know, continuing and expanding a lot of these really important kind of social democratic social programs um, domestically uh, on, on social issues, too, um, there's a lot of openings uh, where, you know, uh, 
where uh, she said that she supports, you know, for example, abortions in, uh, you know, in specialized cases. Now, obviously, that you know, that's not as far as we would all like, but you have to remember the context of the region. I mean, it, it is quite um, radical and, and a really positive um, move. So it's going to be um, an uphill battle, uh, one not only with, you know, potential American and, and more importantly, business interest sort of, uh, you know, interference, dealing with Congress in the country. Um, and then also, as has been, uh, you know, sort of the, the early, um, the uh, as things have, as have pointed to early, that there will be kind of reopening of relations with Venezuela, Cuba, and China. Um, so there's something that we'll be watching uh, pretty closely on this show. But some good news to celebrate that the right-wing party was essentially repudiated um, by, you know, a, a landslide victory. A uh, left-wing government has come back into power and hopefully can right some of the wrongs that have been done to the country over the last decade. And that right-wing government and everybody who helped install them have lots of blood on their hands. Like, in, in addition to Berta yeah. Carceres, um, hundreds of human rights and, like, activist-type folks just on the left just being murdered by death squads that are connected mm -hmm. to powerful families there. So, I mean, that, that's real. Uh, and uh, Absolutely. Yeah. And, the, and the celebrations you were seeing in response to the Castro victory there, um, I, I think, show, <laughs> um, you know, the, the relief. And, you know, she ran on the campaign of a, this is a refoundation. Um, of the country and you know we were showing you know solidarity and support from uh, the united states as they begin that project absolutely shall we go to a break right quick um, yeah we'll uh, go to a break we'll be back with paul prescott Yeah, we're back now. Uh, we're back now with uh, Matt Leck and David Grisham and, uh, <laughs> and and Paul Prescott. Paul is a Philly public school teacher. He, uh, you also have seen his work on uh, Jacobin. Uh, at least that's where I'm familiar with him from. Uh, he knows a uh, union man through and through and running to represent Philadelphia, uh, Pennsylvania's 8th Senate District. Paul, welcome to Left Reckoning. Yeah, thanks so much for having me here. Uh, really excited to uh, talk to you, uh, and and I love the. Um, I'm very interested in your what you're going to bring to state politics. I think um, it's an interesting conversation we're ready to have. So, mm -hmm. but first, before that, talk to us about uh, the uh, district district you're running in. Where where are we at? Is it uh, urban, suburban, a uh, mix of both? Who who's working yeah. in it? Yeah, it's a, it's a little bit of everything. So the 8th Senate District in Pennsylvania encompasses um, West Philadelphia, Southwest Philadelphia, 
um, a little bit of South Philadelphia and actually a portion of Delaware County, which is like the surrounding suburbs of, uh, of Philadelphia. And, you know, this di district is very big. I mean, the population is almost 250,000 people who live in it. Um, and it's very diverse in many ways. Um, it's mostly working class black population. There are significant sections of, you know, East and West African immigrants, Caribbean immigrants. You know, it has kind of a, this little bit of everything. There's a University of Pennsylvania is in the district and it has like those surrounding areas. It also has a much more working class part and then kind of this suburbs uh, feel. Um, but, you know, along with that, you know, it, uh, in Philadelphia, you know, it has some of the deepest, you know, most longstanding poverty um, mm -hmm. in the city. And, and even, you know, lately, and we might talk about this more, but like, um, you know, some of the worst gun violence uh, that we've been seeing in the last uh, few years. Um, so, you know, it's a district that uh, I think is really in need of change. Um, you know, the current incumbent who I will be uh, running against is Anthony Hardy Williams, who inherited the seat from his dad, essentially. Um, and, uh, you know, he's been there for over 20 years and he's uh, never faced a primary challenge. Wow. That sounds like a good recipe to uh, knock off an incumbent, hopefully. That's, I hope, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, um, you go ahead, Dave. No, I mean, I was just hoping, um, you know, Paul, for people who aren't familiar with you, like, you know, what's what's your background and what are you sort of bringing that, um, you know, that, that district sort of hasn't seen in that office for a while? Yeah, and I'll go all the way back since Barbados was in the news uh, yesterday. Yeah. I'll say this, uh, you know, my father is actually from Barbados, an island in the Caribbean. Um, and, you know, he's also a public school teacher. So I spent a lot of time on his summer breaks growing up there. And uh, some of my family there were actually very active in the Barbados Labor Party. Um, and in that country, they actually have two labor parties, believe it or not. Um, one of them, I would argue, is the fake one. But I won't get into internal Bayesian politics right now. Um, so, you know, I, I had some family that were active with them. I think that really kind of set the framework for me politically. Um, my first real political campaign was actually on a fresh, as a, my freshman year at a university called Temple in North Philadelphia. And I count myself lucky because that year the um, Temple Hospital nurses went on strike. Um, and I got involved kind of just like haphazardly in a student support campaign. And it was a very successful strike. It was actually one of very few strikes in the year 2010. This is like coming off the recession. There weren't many strikes happening. Um, yeah, it was a very successful strike. And really from that moment on, I was kind of won over to the labor movement. It was a great real life example. You know, this is how you can stand up mm -hmm. the corporate power, how you can actually win. Um, so, you know, the rest of my time as a student, I was involved supporting uh, local unions, um, getting to know that world. And, uh, you know, and then I became a public school teacher um, and, you know, definitely have seen the, the effects of the, the cuts to public education that have been happening in Philadelphia. I mean, there's really no overstating just how, you know, devastating it's become. And, you know, I always say, like, I think we're if we keep going down this path, we're 15, 20 years away from a totally privatized district. Mm. And if you think it can't happen, I mean, look at New Orleans after Katrina. You know, there's not one single public school left. And I think many cities are heading that way, uh, maybe at a slower pace, but I think if, if nothing is done. Um, and so, you know, I've also been a DSA member active in the left. Um, and I think specifically just trying to bring the worlds of the left and labor together. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, that's been a lot of my work. And honestly, that's kind of being reflected in this campaign. And that's kind of coalition that we're going to need um, to win. Um, and yeah, so I think, I mean, really... I almost lost track of the question, but, uh, you know, of why I'm running, what I'm trying to bring, you know, I really at its heart, it's about public investment, like starting to reverse the logic of austerity, um, reinvigorating mm -hmm. the public sector. Um, and, you know, and I think really naming the enemy in Pennsylvania, I mean, like so many states in the country, but um, we have a huge problem with like, I mean, the rich just don't pay taxes. Uh, some of our wealthiest corporations, you know, I'll name Comcast, for example, which by the way, made a profit of $20 billion in one quarter of 2020 alone. Um, so in Philadelphia, they don't pay property taxes. Um, Pennsylvania is the second largest producer wow. of natural gas in the country. Don't pay taxes. Uh, so, you know, there's, there's so much room to work with if we were to really go after this revenue to invest in public schools. Um, and I think, you know, being kind of a labor candidate, bringing that perspective to this. And I think especially when it comes to, uh, you know, climate change and 
how to develop renewable energy in a pro-labor way. Um, I think someone that's kind of bringing that perspective of how we can actually do that. Yeah, can, I, can you speak to the, um, the why the state senate is a good place to go do this? To anybody you know um, skeptical of that as a body, because uh, right. I'm really curious about what we can do there. Yeah, and you know it's it's funny. I mean, this is my first time running for office, and like it's kind of crazy. It's very ironic to me. I've I've always been someone that's believed, and I still believe like you know work in the movements is actually the most important thing to do, and I think specifically the labor movement. And I have been convinced, you know, in recent years, I think starting with Bernie, but also others like, you know, we can't ignore the state, you know, it needs to be reflected yeah. in the state. And I think it's better to have candidates who actually come out of a movement kind of also uh, reflected in electoral um, politics. And, you know, some people have asked, like, well, why not try for something like city level first um, in running? And, you know, my answer is not that I just want to be like a big shot or something, but um you know, I think cities are very limited fiscally um, in what they can do. And don't get me wrong. I mean, if mm -hmm. someone, I'd much rather have a good city council person than a bad one. And there's a lot they can do. Um, but, you know, really the revenue to really do the things, the ambitious things that the left wants to do are at the state and the federal level. Um, so I think state legislatures are actually really important. Um, and also, you know, I'm not an expert in this, but I think I heard this from Harvey K, who is an expert in the New Deal. But you know, some of the, the most successful New Deal programs were kind of first piloted at the state level. Mm -hmm. And I think we there's a lot we can do to kind of show uh, in reality that some of these things can work and create a constituency at the state level if we can't do it at the federal level. Um, and so, yeah, I think, you know, and I think particularly for some of the issues dear to my heart, like education, for example, you know, in Philadelphia, we really get screwed at the state level. That's where they're, they really keep the funding from us. That's where it's really unequal. And again, if we really were to tap into the revenue sources that are there by taxing the rich, there's a whole lot you can do at the state level. Um, and that includes, you know, some more ambitious like Green New Deal infrastructure programs. Again, if they're not going to be done at the federal level, I think mm -hmm. we can start doing them at the state level. And that has a really important political impact, not just from doing them, but I think warming up um, some maybe unions in the building trades or people that are more skeptical that this thing can work. I think we need to prove to them that it can work by actually getting concrete projects done. Um, and again, I think there's room at the state to do that. You know, states do have a lot of revenue to work with. I mean, on that, um, I think one thing that's really critical for like left democratic socialist politicians to think about uh, is one, how we're going to be uh, dealing with climate change in a way that works for working people too. Right. You know, cause I don't know, there's been a long time that on the left where there's this kind of slogan that like, there is no like capital solution to, um, you know, to climate change. And I don't, I think one, the capital solution would be a nightmare, but I can see just mass austerity. Like, like I could see them just sort of pulling back, um, a lot of jobs and, and opportunities for people, um, you know, sequestering themselves off in areas where they're able, anyway, I don't need to paint the whole dystopian picture, mm -hmm. but like, we do have to just be prepared that just like acting on climate change is, is not enough. Like, we have to do it in a way that works for working people and uh, you know doesn't put us in a situation where we're pitting ourselves as a, as working class against one another to defend certain um, you know jobs and livelihoods. I mean, you know, what is the the kind of path forward in Pennsylvania um, for trying to build you know pro climate policies that also uh, work for labor and working people? Yeah, I mean, I think we're at a really interesting juncture. I mean, both in Pennsylvania and across the country, and like. I think there's a lot of opportunities here. Mm -hmm. well, you know, I think something we have to realize, and often when I've talked to people in the building trades or, or union leaders, you know, a lot of them say like, yeah, it sounds great, the idea of like, you know, green jobs, but like we need to see that it's real. And mm -hmm. we also need to have a real plan for what do we do with the dirty energy jobs? You know, mm -hmm. um, the reality is at the moment, and I don't think this is inevitable forever, but right now jobs in solar and wind are most of the time non-union and, you know, much lower paying. And it's like, I don't think I could look someone in the face who's making 75000 a year, 80000 yeah. which is family sustaining, you know, it's not like they're rich, and tell them, well, no, like, now you'll make 21 an hour, you know? Mm -hmm. And so, you know, we just need to have specifics. And a lot of unions are actually in this interesting position, like, for example, the electricians and sheet metal workers, where they both work in clean energy and dirty energy. So, like, Mm. Sheet metal workers retrofit buildings um, and to be energy efficient. So there were a massive program to do that. And 
one of the things I'm proposing is around renovating our public school buildings, which are like literally falling apart. And you could do that in an energy efficient way and create jobs. You know, they would be the ones working on that, but they also work on pipelines. And, you know, I had an interesting conversation with the sheet metal workers president in my area. And he said like, look, I'm all for green energy, but it's just like, what are we going to do for those people that are, are out of that job? Um, you know, but I do think there's a lot of room, and this is the perspective that um, a great organization, Climate Jobs in New York, um, we actually had them on the Jackman Show once. They've done a lot of work with labor in New York on green jobs. And what they said was like, look, just start where there is common agreement. Like, let's start on the easier things first to gain trust and show them that this is real. And I think that's the prerequisite to dealing with the harder questions. Mm -hmm. And I think there's a lot of low-hanging fruit. I mean, again, you know, we've done some things that a lot of people thought five years ago wasn't possible where we've had panels in Philadelphia with, with DSA and the local electricians union talking about rebuilding public schools. And I love that issue because like no one has to lose a job from that. Everyone yeah. wins. You know, if you expand public transit, you know, one of the unions that endorsed me is um, a team says you need that they uh, build and maintain railway uh, infrastructure, you know, so they would love if we had high speed rail. So I think kind of starting with those broad areas of agreement and really working to make them a, them a reality, um, it's kind of like where we start from. And I do think candidates should get more serious about saying, what exactly do we mean by just transition? Like, and this, yeah. is, this is where I think we do have to be Elizabeth Warren and we, we got to have a, a plan um, because <laughs> many unions actually are, had been, are cynical even about that term because they've heard it used even going back to the 90s. 2000s, you know, and it hasn't played out. And I think, and this is something I'm actually working with on my research team is like, let's come up with some real numbers, you know, and Bernie actually had some pretty good thoughts about this, about mm -hmm. saying, you know, at least five years, they would get paid at their, uh, you know, the level of their previous wage, you know, in the transition. Now, the challenge is, you know, convincing people we can do this, because if we're going to do a real just transition, that's, of course, a lot of money, um, you know, that we would be dedicating to that. And, uh, you know, so it's always this chicken, egg, chicken and egg thing of maybe unions might be skeptical because of the political realities. You know, we don't have the power yet to really tax the rich at that level that we would need to. Um, but I think if just demonstrating more seriousness and thoughtfulness about it will go a long way for labor at kind of starting to convince them. Can you just talk about your uh, labor support, uh, sorry, particularly if, as a first time candidate, uh, you know, just having the best platform isn't enough. And uh, uh, for anybody who's thinking about running for office, like what, what kind of work do you have to put in, uh, basically? Yeah, you know, because unfortunately, you know, often labor, they are, you know, they, they'll, they want to play it safe. Um, they want to back the winner. They don't want to damage relationships with certain incumbents. Um, you know, and I think, Sometimes there's room to criticize that, but I think sometimes there's a very real reason they're doing that. Um, and yeah, I mean, so far we have four union endorsements in my campaign, and I'm very hopeful of getting some more soon. Um, you know, I mentioned Teamsters, uh, not just maintenance workers, but also UPS workers. Um, and there's also been a big change in the national Teamsters leadership. Um, you know, the community college in Philadelphia, their faculty union has endorsed as well. Um, and honestly, a lot of this just came from you know, be, well before I ran for years, you know, my activity was in labor before I mm -hmm. had any thought of running. And these are really just, and this is like, there's just no shortcut to these are relationships that were built for so many years and mm -hmm. uh, kind of people knowing that I take labor seriously. Um, and, you know, even some of it was good timing of some new kind of new blood in some of local Philly uh, union leadership um, that, you know, I, I've kind of taken a risk that maybe others wouldn't. So, yeah, I mean, it's kind of like uh, I don't have an answer besides like, you know, really doing that work over the long term. And, and that is something I'm proud of, if, you know, in our DSA chapter in Philadelphia is like we have a very close relationship with the labor movement. You know, we we're always showing up for them. Mm -hmm. And after a while, you know, they really take notice of that. Um, you know, even honestly, there's some union leaders who come to Philly DSA meetings who if you ask them in a separate context, we'd be like, no, nah, I'm not a socialist. Like, that's craziness. But. Because they know, like, you know, you all, have, whatever you think ideologically, like, you all have supported us on this thing, so I will support you. Um, yeah, it really is just a long-term fight. Um, but I do think, you know, and this is something I thought about during 
the push around the PRO Act, which is sadly was defeated. But, in, you know, in DSA, there was a big campaign around it nationally. And it's kind of had me thinking about a really good way to segue from movement politics to electoral politics. I mean, let's mm -hmm. just say, you know, a DSA chapter in an area where a Democrat did not support the PRO Act mounted a campaign with labor that could set up in a few years time, someone out of that DSA chapter primarying that anti-labor Dem and actually having labor support. Um, mm -hmm. I think that's kind of like the, the medium term thinking we should be doing of like kind of always having a virtuous cycle of movement activity that can lead to electoral activity that can reinforce movement activity. I think that's kind of how we should think about our electoral politics. Yeah, I mean, it's like creating a space where people who want to get things done know, you know, this is the place and the people to speak with, right? Versus right. like just the folks who have some interesting ideas and, you know, throw a good happy hour party or something like that, right? It's just like, yeah, you know, and, you know what they say, I mean, it's very cliche, but like about how much of politics comes down to relationships. I mean, mm -hmm. it's true both in, I think, movement organizing and electoral organizing, you know, because again, I, I mean, unfortunately, it doesn't just come down to like who has the better labor platform. Um, you know, if, if that were true, you know, we'd have a lot more labor support behind certain candidates. And just for me, who's like not super familiar with Philly. Uh, I mean, there's a huge, I mean, I know like the left movement there is, is, is pretty large and involved. I know a lot of folks there, but, um, when it comes to unions compared to other parts of the country, I mean, is there a larger share of, of labor, um, than, you know, I mean, certainly more right. as I would imagine, but, uh, mm -hmm. you know, they, they yeah, you know, labor history, Right. And they're one of the, I mean, unfortunately, shrinking amount of labor, true labor towns. Um, I think mm -hmm. Chicago is probably the biggest one we have left. Um, yeah. But, you know, in, in Philadelphia, labor is still, um, you know, a decent density and it's, it's a real force in electoral politics. Um, and that's the, I mean, besides on principle, wanting to have labor on your side. I mean, we even saw this with Joe Biden. I mean, the work mm -hmm. that the Union Unite here did, I think literally won the election for Joe Biden, but, you know, they have an infrastructure. Um, some unions have better ones than others, but like these are also, you know, door knockers, sources of money um, and power. Um, but yeah, Philadelphia has a sizable labor movement. And again, I think on the more molecular level for people paying attention, there's been some interesting new blood in certain union leaderships um, happening where, I, you know, I think there's kind of this labor left that's been developing Philadelphia for several years. Um, and you kind of start seeing that play out in electoral politics. Uh, I want to change gears a little bit. It's come up, a, uh, but just to address it straight on, uh, as somebody who has taught in public schools, um, charter schools, why should a Democratic voter or a parent of a child or someone just in, interested in educating society not accept a candidate that supports charter schools? Yeah. And, you know, this can be a it's a complicated issue to talk about. And, you know, I'm, I'm always clear that when it comes to this, like the enemy is not parents that send mm -hmm. their kids to charter schools or students or teachers at charter schools, you know, and it's a very tragic example of like the classic tactic of privatization. So you you defund the public service and it, the quality suffers. And, you know, again, I I'm not going to lie. I mean, so many public schools in Philadelphia are just not doing well. And then, it, you know, it warms the ground up for average people to say, like, well, I can't trust this public institution. So many parents, you know, they are making a very it's not like they have this ideological commitment to privatization. They're just making this very pragmatic choice about what do I do about my kid next year? You know, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so just putting it out there like, you know, the enemy is not the parents. But I think right. what people have to realize, like, really, it's about following the money of, of charter schools. Um, and, you know, there's certain things that people um don't don't really know about charters sometimes is like a lot of them are publicly funded but privately run and what that means besides like in many cases there's someone making a profit somewhere off of it a lot of times off of real estate um mm. what that also means is that it's actually actively draining money from the public school district so like philly public schools are literally financially supporting schools that are not part of their system that are undermining them um, and it kind of creates this, uh, it's almost like a divide and conquer strategy because many charter schools are able to deny certain students. So students mm. with special needs, especially, and you know, so then it's like, okay, you don't go there and like maybe your test scores or your data looks better, but the public schools now carry the, you know, are, have to 
accept whoever, which I, you know, which is as it should be. Um, but, and, and, you know, and also the big thing I think is actually looking at the data showing that charters are actually failing at a higher rate than public schools, even by their own measures. Um, there was a great report. I wish I remember the name of the group uh, that, that put it out um, studying. It was a very long term study of charters nationally over the last 20, 30 years. And what they found is like an, an, an enormous amount of them close very quickly and are failing or there's scandals of fraud because there's not, um, you know, oversight of them. So that's another thing we have to kind of just reckon with is that many charters are actually not doing very well. Hmm. And, you know, I actually used to substitute teaching charters as I was, uh, you know, um, getting my teaching certificate. And what I found is that, okay, the schools that were pretty good, it wasn't a mystery why, like they had small class size, they had extra programs, they had brand new buildings. And it's Mm. like, well, yeah, they're getting public funding plus private funding. And it's like, really no child, no parent needs to make that choice. We should just fully fund and support our public schools. Um, But, you know, they're defunding them and then holding up charters as this alternative. Um, and, you know, we really have to ask ourselves, like, why are so many billionaires in love with charters? Like, why was Trump's education secretary, Betsy DeVos, so big on big on charters? You know, um, and part of it is a labor issue, too. Charters are non-union. So this is a way they see to break up the largest uh, section of unionized people now is our teachers and the public sector in general. So, you know, if they were to privatize a district like they did in New Orleans, you're getting rid of a unionized uh, workforce. Um, so that really, that's what it's about. is like follow the money and you see like, you know, the charters aren't doing as well as they claim. They're actively hurting public schools. And, you know, Philadelphia is a great example. We have a district called Lower Marion School District, which is, you know, you could walk to it from a portion in West Philly that looks like you're in two different worlds. And in Lower Marion, you know, those parents don't feel like they need to send their kids to charters. Um, mm-hmm. And it's, it's very clear, you know, if every school district was like that public school district, people wouldn't feel the need to make this choice. Um, but this is a policy choice that we're deciding to, to, you know, underfund our public schools. Yeah, I feel lucky in this response or in this regard for being from North Dakota because there's this Harvard economist like five or so years ago. I think his name was Raj Chetty, and he did uh, schools and income mobility. And North Dakota was one of the few places that's like roughly comparable to Canada. And I'm like, I, I was kind of surprised by that. And it's basically because you don't have the massive income inequality like you have in other places. Private schools weren't a huge thing. There's Catholic schools. So you got a little bit of, of that. But I, then I, I move out to the East and you see that it's just Byzantine uh, education out here. And it's, yeah, like you said, like and, the privatization and, doesn't seem to be really empowering people um, on a on a broad level, uh, despite like, right. the, like you said, the difficult decision that it's basically like putting parents downstream of a already ideological choice, which is mm-hmm. we're going to privatize schools. Right. Yeah. And, you know, my position of a, a moratorium, at least of building new charters is actually consistent with the NAACP, which um, a few years ago formally endorsed that position, which I think was a big step because charters, I think, have very cynically framed themselves as a civil rights uh, movement because again, I mean, uh, of course, disproportionately, it's you know, black and brown school districts that are underfunded are failing students, and then charters come as this, uh, you know, trying to be a savior. Um, and one other thing I wanted to mention, you know, I mean, first of all, the funding should not be based on property taxes because any yeah. fifth grader could find out you're just going to reproduce inequality. But also, I mean, even when it is on property taxes, I mean, like I just mentioned, in Philadelphia, we're giving Comcast tax breaks. Also, I think we have to look at some of the, the elite Ivy League institutions. So University of Penn has a $20 billion endowment, and I mm. billion with a B, um, and that is not taxed. You know what I mean? Um, and so that's stuff we could be, that's revenue that we need for our schools. And then again, at the state level, I mean, we shouldn't be a large natural gas producing state and letting them just not pay taxes, you know? Um, so again, we, we know the money is there, of course, uh, if we were to go after it. I mean, this stuff is like, 
like here, Tesla just built their truck factory outside of Austin and they negotiated, you know, tax breaks to school districts upwards of like $60 million. Right. Um, and I don't care how many little programs that Musk says he'll be doing where he might let a kid, you know, you know pretend to be an engineer for an afternoon. I'd much rather have $60 million right. in public schools in the, in the area. Well, let me describe you some, I mean, this is so mind boggling. So going back to Comcast, they're one of the biggest sponsors of city year program, so mm-hmm. like AmeriCorps, I mean, it's these, you know, young Mm -hmm. idealists who go into classrooms to help as support staff. So, and support staff of schools that don't have support staff because they're underfunded, right? And city year workers, at least in Philadelphia, they're literally given food stamps because it's like, you're just totally not paid. This is supposed to be Mm -hmm. service. I mean, you're paid a little bit, but it's like understood that you're getting food stamps. And Comcast is the sponsor. I'm like, man, Ain't that some shit? Like, if they would just pay their taxes, we wouldn't need something called city year. But they're going to now, through indirectly, pay way, way less um, to get away with doing this. Um, I mean, it's just it's just mind boggling. <laughs> yeah, th- I mean, and then you know, rely on public programs that they themselves are underfunding, right? <laughs> right. Um, yeah, and it's like we just can't. I mean, I, and it's amazing that you know the mainstream of the Democratic Party the only thing they've been able to come up with the last 40 years, at least as a development strategy is these kinds of tax breaks. And they come up, you know, every year it's a new name, uh, Keystone opportunity zones, uh, whatever zones, something, it's always a new name, but the same concept. And it's like, I mean, how many times do we need to do this to see that nothing will get better? You know, things are just only getting worse, especially in our, in our inner cities. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, this is a party that had uh, Uber uh, get pride of place at a, a party convention instead of uh, taxi drivers. But um, <laughs> a, a final thing to, uh, we want to touch on is, um, and I, I saw your discussion with Mike from PA um, and this violent crime wave. You and this is you know we talked about uh, with El Katsanis you know, in the context of a pandemic and like how much people are struggling. Um, you know, it can be understood, but there needs to be an answer for it ultimately as well. What is the sort of uh, left-wing uh, response to crime uh, uh, and violent crime particularly? And what are you also hearing from voters and uh, what do they uh, imagine their solutions to be? Yeah, um, you know, and I think the first part is like, we should be able to walk on two legs. It's like, we, we have to acknowledge it's real and it's a problem. I mean, Philadelphia has mm-hmm. had over 500 homicides um, this year already. And, you know, and you can acknowledge that without buying into like tough on crime, throw everyone in jail logic. But if you don't acknowledge it, you just seem like you live on a different planet and, you know, gun violence is not new to Philadelphia, but I can assure you it's really on a different level at the moment. You know, it's really impacting people's daily lives. Like, should I send my kid to after school program? Cause I'm afraid they're going to walk home at night and get caught up. Um, you know, so I think first you just have to acknowledge that it is a problem. Um, you know, it's not just the media hype or, or something like that. Um, and yeah, I think for the left, I mean, how I'm trying to frame it is like, this is a problem of, of public investment. Um, mm-hmm. And as I've started to knock doors in my district, you know, almost, I mean, nine times out of 10, uh, that is the number one issue coming up is uh, gun violence, public safety. Um, and, you know, I think people, it really does resonate when I tell them, you know, I've taught in many schools where there's no, after school programs at all. Um, you know, I'm not saying that would solve every issue, but like, you know, if kids had more things to do, somewhere to go. And also it's really just like having a future. I mean, I think mm-hmm. a lot of people are not dumb and they can see, okay, my public school is totally underfunded. There's no good job to go to. And I'm not saying it's a straight line from A to B, I'll, I'll go shoot someone. But it's like, I think there's a general feeling of just total hopelessness and no future. And, um, you know, so when I talk to to voters and say, you know, we need to invest in our schools, we need good paying jobs, um, more, more kinds of programs. I think that really resonates with them. And, you know, and at the same time, I will say, I think in this moment, you know, people are not responding well to the ideas of defunding the police. And I'm, I'm saying that through polls and and it's just something Mm -hmm. that I don't think makes sense to people in this moment. And it's not that people I think are just like totally pro, cop and you know uh throw everyone in jail type of mindset but you know i think Mm -hmm. it's something that doesn't resonate because i don't think it makes sense in this moment but i think you can talk about public investment generally um and still get the point across of like where we need to be focusing Mm -hmm. our energies but i do think it's something the left 
has to take seriously. And, and honestly, I mean, in some ways, combine our bigger policy goals with even some more technocratic solutions. I mean, we have this problem that's been emerging. I'm still learning about it myself around what's called ghost guns. Um, these like 3D printed mm -hmm. uh, illegal and traceable guns that are really just like flooding uh, the streets and making things worse. And like a lot of times I'll say, I'm like, look, I'd rather law enforcement get a handle on that than be stopping people for traffic stops, you know, and harassing people. Mm -hmm. um, or even, you know, talk about even more localized community programs. Again, like I think the biggest answer really is that we need massive investment on a style we haven't seen in a hundred years, but I think there's other things we can do. You know, I, I've done some work with a local youth organization actually partnering with uh, local unions and kind of like giving them workshops on union jobs. Like what is a union? Why is it important, but also helping them get those jobs. Um, you know, I think holding those kind of smaller concrete examples up for people in the short term before we can do the bigger stuff is helpful. Um, but yeah, you know, it's a, it's something we just have to like pay attention to and understand is a real problem. People are going through. And, and sometimes, you know, it's like, it's a glaring contradiction where some people who are like acting like it doesn't exist are disproportionately like affluent white middle-class people mm. not actually dealing with what people are really going through when it comes to gun violence. And that's kind of, you know, we need to really be careful of like, just, you just come off as totally out of touch, you know? Yeah. Cause I mean, our opponents are very prepared to, you know, uh, to utilize that to, to their advantage and, you know, as a scare tactic to pursue, you know, the kind of the worst kind of most brutal policing and also underfunding more and more programs in favor of increasing police budgets, you know, across the board. Yeah, I, I agree. I think it just does us no favors at all to, to deny things that are happening around us. We have to be able to, talk to people and, and to talk to people in our community and, and figure out solutions. Um, because I don't know, because the right has a lot of cheap and easy slogan kind of solutions to these things. Right. And if you're just sort of pretending like there's no problem on the ground, uh, you know, it really does open up a lot. Right. Of so again, it's like, it's a very, I mean, when you're in a desperate situation, you grasp at whatever. So like mm -hmm. the idea of like, yeah, we just stick the cops on them. You know, it's like, if there's no other alternative, you know, we shouldn't be surprised if people uh, support that. Yeah. Well, I mean, there's there's a lot going on. I mean, I'm really excited to see this campaign as it develops. I'm going to put up uh, ways that people can uh, get more information and potentially donate. But could you give people a kind of uh, you know calendar of what's ahead, um, you know, for the for the primary and the election? Yeah. Um, so this primary will take place on May 17th. Um, you know, also another fun fact, I mean, I, I talked about the district. This is a redistricting year. Uh, oh, wow. so there's a chance that I hope not too much, um, but the district could uh, change a little bit um, before the election. Um, but yeah, it's going to be on May 17th. It's, it's you know, this is really a primary race um, that we're dealing with. Um, but very soon, especially come late December, early January, we'll be ramping up the field game in terms of door knocking. So, I mean, anyone, if you're in the Philadelphia area or a neighboring state, I want to take a trip up. Um, if you go to my website, there's a, a volunteer button. Um, you can definitely get involved in that. Um, but yeah, I mean, from now until May, this is where things are serious. And, you know, I can't stress enough. Unfortunately, we do not have publicly funded elections. Um, mm -hmm. And again, my opponent, I mean, he's literally supported by billionaires. I mean, you can look up Jeffrey Yass. That's his main uh, supporter financially, a, a billionaire. So, you know, the, and he's not a billionaire. That's like, we should be taxing, uh, uh, you right. know, no, uh, no. Comcast not more. Good, not one of the good ones. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah. So that's what I'm up against. So like, you know, donation, whatever you can is really important. Um, you know, and part of this too, you, you know, I can't be a hypocrite and talk about labor rights and not pay my staff well. So I have a really hardworking staff. I got to make sure I'm paying them living wages. Like that's this money isn't just going in some to useless stuff. Um, so that's really important. If you can donate anything, especially, you know, we're coming up on December 31st is the deadline for my first public campaign finance report. Um, and so, you know, we want to raise as much money before then to really show that this is a serious and strong campaign. Yeah, people hit up that act blue. I mean, that's the thing for candidates that have billionaires behind them. The difference between like hiring two people versus hiring four people, that's not really something that's uh, difficult. Right. For them. That's something they think about. But yeah, every little bit helps, particularly when you got a great candidate. So, Paul, uh, mm -hmm. thank you so much and uh, best of luck. Out there. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. 
Yeah, take care. All right. All right. Are we good I mean, to? Yeah, we're st we're still rolling here. Um, uh, donate to Paul Zach Blue. Yeah, that's, I mean, uh, that's... seriously, uh, you know, if if he didn't get it from that that interview, I mean, he's he's the real deal. And I mean, I don't know. I have people who are thinking creatively and strategically about state power, not just for you know winning some kind of policies that are progressive, but actually finding them as sites to build working class power, I think is really critical. And like, yeah. that's an encouraging thing that's worth supporting if you can. Well, and like that thing that you come from movements like that, that's why, you know, it's, it's, you can't just do what Paul's done when it comes to uh, <laughs> building relationships with labor. Uh, but that's what ultimately needs to be done. And so if you're like on that path, um, you know, well, that, that continue on, I guess. Yeah. Well, let me, uh, is it is it Griscom? Uh, uh, <laughs> yeah, is it a throwback to it? We're doing a throwback jam. Um, I was actually looking earlier because uh, I I did uh, a thing on Paul Volcker a couple years ago on on TMBS. Man, it was a little. It was nice to watch to watch all three of us hanging out again. I haven't watched many of those videos these days, but uh, yeah, I mean, I guess we got uh, we got we got to talk about inflation, man, and. Uh, it's tough because there's a lot to get into. And um, this is not going to be the big segment that sort of like debunks like top five GOP claims of inflation. This is a talk to help us um, as members of the working class, people who are trying to get involved in politics, make people's lives better, understand how inflation is used um, to try to avoid political conversations, and also how it's sort of abstracted to a way that makes it seem like it's just like a mechanical process and not the result of people's actual concrete decisions. Um, so inflation is something that we're seeing uh, being talked about on both the right um, wing, you know, cable news, um, you know, ecosystem, but even more so um, in, you know, left liberal publications and things like the New York Times, right? This is a, um, you know, this is something that is in the discourse of American politics right now. And you should be very worried when that starts to, to pop up because what it typically, what typically follows a kind of inflation panic um, is a kind of crackdown on labor and on, you know, social programs for working people, right? But before we get there, like, you know, let's understand this from a social perspective. One, just like we were talking about with Paul a second ago when it comes to policing and violent crime, do not sit here and start doing things like putting your head in the sand and acting like it's not happening. People are experiencing higher, um, you know, higher prices for daily goods. Now we can sort of locate which ones. Um, and the different reasons for that. And I think that's really important. Um, but I think one of the big differences between people like us, you know, socialists, um, and I think a lot of like left liberals or even just like, you know, kind of centrist liberals who are trying to avoid the conversation because they want to make sure that Biden doesn't get dinged politically for something. Don't fall into that trap. Right. Um, People are experiencing, uh, you know, higher prices for goods and services that they need. Right? There's some very simple explanations for that. Um, you know that uh, that are we, we're still on. You know, experiencing a massive pandemic and supply chains are really, really messed up. Right? And the entire way that we've been producing goods and services in this country um, has been really challenged uh, by the, uh, you know, by the global pandemic. Uh, yeah. Before, yeah. Well, I mean, I don't want to, I don't want to sidebar us too much, but I mean, conversations I had with folks over Thanksgiving, like anybody that deals with supply chains at all. And I got two family members that deal with supply, both in hospitals and like heavy machinery. And it is just insane. Right. Like, like, mm -hmm. um, and it, it's, a, it, I think like the real problem is you see like the port of Los Angeles saying, Hey, we're looking at actually expanding our rail capacity. It's like, well, that should have been done uh, a decade and a half ago. <laughs> No, I mean, Matt, this is like, this is really important. And we'll get a little bit more in depth in this in a minute. But like, one of the solutions to this aspect is not to cut wages or to pull back spending. It's actually to invest dramatically in these things like critical infrastructure, right. in these kind of critical industries. Um, you know, when we're talking about ports and our capabilities of being able to, you know, bring products into the United States, right? Like that stuff that like the solution here is actually not, you know, tightening the, the purse strings. It's actually expanding that on, on a federal level, right? In, increasing spending. So like, no, I, exactly. And like, this is why it's really important not to fall into this kind of like, overly mechanical understanding 
of um, inflation, right? I talked about the way that a lot of liberals are sort of falling in this trap of like, and I think that's it's starting to wane now, but the first couple of months of it, when we were seeing early signs that this was going to be a problem, there was just constant like, well, actually they're wrong, right? And this isn't like happening. Again, you can, you can put things in context without sort of falling into this trap of saying like, I'm going to ignore what other people are experiencing, right? I mean, there was a terrible CNN piece. I don't know if you saw this map about oh, some family in Texas that was like, struggling and they had this they just let this family say you know what their budget was and it was just completely um you know ridiculous and you know you could easily fact check it and show that it was a kind of absurd personal retelling um of of what they were experiencing and i mean if you were to trust the numbers i mean inflation would have been up like 250 percent or something like that which is not their levels that we're at um but i don't know i think there's also an overcorrection on some people's side to be like this is exactly what happens everything you're hearing about it um is a lie, right? Because here's the thing, um, you know, while there are some contexts where inflation can be helpful for, for example, debtors, um, inflation does matter. It matters um, for different classes and different people in different industries in different ways, you know, but for working people, I mean, it does matter if it's difficult for you to sort of budget because, you know, prices of goods and services that you use on a regular basis have gone up in a, a couple of weeks. It can be extremely damaging as what we're seeing right now, where we've seen some kind of moderate wage gains um, for workers. If you see inflation just sort of pop up and, you know, override uh, wage gains, that is certainly a problem. Um, you know, but this kind of understanding of inflation, right, in just like the abstract, is can be um, understanding it just in the abstract. You know, sort of takes us out of what we've been experiencing. Because I'll tell you one thing that has we've seen massive inflation on on my entire lifetime, and that's rent, right. Yeah. Like talk about things that like, so it, yes, it does matter when prices increase and it certainly matters when prices yeah. increase in ways that sort of don't um, match wages. Um, but to sort of act like the kind of struggles that everyday Americans are facing, everyday working class Americans are fake, facing just started happening a few months ago is completely ludicrous, right? I mean, we, we talk about all the time, the fact that more and more people feel that they could never afford a home. Hell, most people feel like they could never really um, get past, you know, uh, find any kind of level of financial comfort in their life because rent gobbles up the vast majority of their earned wages, right? So that, yeah, so again, increases of things that you have to spend money on, right, is bad. And I think that it's not helpful for people to act like it's not a problem. But again, to act like it's only happening in this one instance um, is, is a mistake. Right. So, anyways, the point is not to downplay, um, you know, the consequences of price increases. Um, but one, as we were talking about earlier, look at the cost. So we were talking about some things you can see supply chain stuff. Certainly, um, you know, some things have been sort of long going inflation um, of, of of prices. And thirdly. Um, you know, and this is where we're going to get into ideology, right? In this kind of mechanical way that people talk um, about uh, the economy and inflation. Um, and that is that wages have gone up too much. People have too much money in their pro um, pockets. And that means that people have more money to bid up the prices of, you know, goods and services. Um, and then because people, uh, employers are forced to pay higher wages, um, prices go up. I want to just put, um, Make it make something very clear to people. This kind of idea that when wages go up, it's because workers are getting too large of a pie. Like this is some kind of mechanical truth, this undeniable truth of of economics, some kind of scientific fact, is extremely dangerous and it's wrongheaded. Because I'll tell you one thing right now. Ask yourself this as a working person: Have you ever? Have you ever increased prices at your job? Have you ever made the decision that the price of the thing that you know is, is being sold, that your labor is being used to produce, that you make the decision that the prices go up? No, the bosses make that decision. Why? Because they want to increase the amount of profits that they are seeing, right? And we can find ways um, to do this where it's not necessarily a zero sum game where wage increases for workers come at the, you know, the loss of profits for big companies, but also understand that when companies make the decision to increase prices wholesale across the board, right, that is a political and social decision by them. 
right? It's not just some kind of like unwritten rule, like, you know, that they were forced to do it. They decided that they didn't want to see the profit margins that they enjoy, the money that goes into their pocket at the end of the day, um, decrease and they increase prices. So again, this is really important um, as we go on a little bit further and understanding why this inflation question is so critical um, for building kind of working class politics in this country, because Years and years, decades and decades um, have been invested in this kind of political project to sort of convince the American population um, that higher wages necessarily means um, higher rates of inflation and instability in the system. When the fact is, is that bosses are making their own kind of decisions, owners, the people who own capital in this system, make decisions that harm the rest of society. And if we're not able to sort of point at that and to find solutions around that, um, then we're going to get what we always get, which is, uh, you know, breaking of labor, um, you know, cuts uh, to social programs and more and more austerity. Um, you know, I mean, this comes out of like the extreme free market propaganda that is taught across the United States. And again, this is like, you know, if you've taken Econ 101 class, so like you were told this and you were tested on this and like your ability to pass the course um, was reliant on your ability to recite this kind of truism, right? Um, that higher wages for workers mean higher prices for goods and services. Again, that is a tactical and political decision by the bosses and, um, and, and the people who own um Beyond that, you know, there's this kind of argument, and this goes into the austerity thing on, on the federal budget more than anything, that too much money in the economy um, means that this kind of, you know, blind machine um, is just forced to raise prices um, in, in mass. And that, again, um, is, is not necessarily true if we are investing in kind of productive um, goods and in productive areas of, of the economy. Um, yeah. But if you want to look at things that have, you know, massive, <laughs> if you want to look at things that create massive amounts of inflation, it's the explosion in financialization um, in the American economy. People might have seen this recently, and I need to remember the damn company's name, but there's now one of these finance apps to help you buy a pizza right? Like a $24 purchase to spread out your payment model. I'm oh, sorry, God. your payments for that. And that goes along with, you know, organizations like Klarna or Firm, right? So much of like innovation and capital over the past, uh, you know, post, uh, uh, post economic recession um, has been in ways to sort of plug in more and more people into the financial economy. And the reason for that is because financial capital has become the dominant form of capital in the United States. Uh, and that came after uh, the big initial freak out over inflation uh, with Paul Volcker um, in, in the 70s, right? But when financial capital starts to become dominant, then you start to see that the only way for you know, capitals to really get ahead is to find ways to sort of extract value from already ongoing economic activity. And what really makes that easy is extremely low interest rates. And this is not an argument that we need to be um, rapidly increasing interest rates, but just understanding that the system of cheap money that we have right now that works for a small group of people creates conditions um, where capital is just sort of trying to flow and attach itself to already existing economic you know, transactions, right? So like, so it's already happening, like people buying food, ordering food, some guy trying to find a way, like, how can I make money off of something, providing, frankly, nothing for that process, um, except for the fact that some people People because their wages are so low are sort of left out of this. Um, you know, you should see something like that as something that certainly plays a role in inflating prices um, for everyone. I, I mean, I'm, I, I don't want to go too far, Matt. So, I, if you have anything uh, you, you want to add, um, let me know. Because I, I wanted to go back to, to Volcker and sort of talk about what happened the last time there was a big panic because I think it should be a very. This is something people should be worried about. Understand that history, but yeah, I mean, I think this will kind of lead into that. Like the 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 point you made about the um, the the message you're hearing a lot from corporate media uh, is that there is like there's too much sloshing or money was sloshing around. Mm -hmm. We shouldn't have given out the the the, the paychecks and to the extent we like acknowledge that logic what they're saying is that if people were more desperate but to the tune of like fourteen hundred dollars they would get down to the port and uh, uh, uh you know get a new job and uh work for that money which is yeah. uh insanely uh like i said ideological that's complete boss logic and uh, there's one other quick point is everybody who works a production job which is not to say like us us knowledge economy mm -hmm. boys um but uh, like talking to knowledge everybody knows 
just in time production and how mm -hmm. fucking disastrous that has uh, turned out to be in exactly this situation where these because and why was just in time production pursued because that's best for the bottom lines of the executives right mm -hmm. and but that means you're not having extra supply at any of the warehouses you don't have any sort of a lot like sort of um uh, re uh redundancy um because that redundancy costs money and now we're fucked because of that because and so like to rebound this to as david's gonna say to say we need to discipline labor more is uh, i mean really given uh the capitalists um you know they're licking both ends of the ice cream cone there no i mean i i think so and like we actually have this tulsi clip before we go uh to, <laughs> to the kind of history um but i you know i think this this kind of understanding um is is really important because i don't know like it's disgusting to watch a a, a mansion sort of talk you know dollars and cents you know you know tighten your your belt when times are hard, um, kind of mentality when this guy's an asshole um, millionaire, right? Um, but they're they're able to get away with this because there has been so much work in this country to make things that are decisions by a certain group of people, a certain class of people, seem as if they are just sort of like you know the reactions of an unfeeling, unthinking being that is the market um yeah. you know one thing that and, and, and this has not always been the case like i know this all the time i think it's really critical for people to remember that workers do not make the decision to increase prices at their workplace that is a decision by management and bosses a really great and this used to be a labor issue um you know in the 50s uh at workers i believe it was a ford plant but i, I could have it mixed up with another one um said that you know they came up with a pretty decent and um you know contract negotiation and ford responded to them and said if we meet these demands we're going to have to increase prices on cars right workers at that plant um at, at ford do not want to see the cars that they're producing become unaffordable in the market because they understand that that works against them as well right they want to make sure that their products are selling um so that you know because you know you're in an organization together right um so you know what they asked for? They asked to see the books of the company to see where there was room um, for them to make cuts and other things so that they could have those demands be met, right? And of course, they were ignored. But this is the, the um, you know the point here is to understand that like all of this kind of like well this is just a, you know the calculation the basic you know you know reality of what we have to do is a lie. These are decisions made by people and it's a power relation um and you need to understand these things as a power relation because we could be having much higher wages we all know this as socialists but like we could be having much higher wages for the vast majority of working people across this country without necessarily seeing a huge spike um in the in the costs of of goods and services for people um it would just mean that owners and bosses would have to relinquish some of their power. And the only way to force them to do that is to build the capacity um, and, and movements um, that, that can do that. But I'm just saying like, when all this inflation stuff is going on, um, this is not unfortunately a solution in the short term, but this is the kind of thing that we have to be able to articulate and to think through if we wanna be able to push back against the system. Because I just wanna take people through a quick history um, of, of Paul Volcker and what happened with what is now known as the Volcker shock, right? Volker is like who you know passed away recently needlessly praised people love him because he's one of those guys who pissed everybody off right um which just means that he was a a monster who um who i don't know i can't i can't sit here and try to figure out what was in his mind and heart but i will tell you about what the decisions that he made did to people not just in the united states um but around the globe um when he became fed chair um he his number one goal was to come up and fight against inflation and to do that he took drastic measures um, he used the power of the federal reserve to devastate american workers bringing um in an era of what we now know the kind of capitalism that we now live under which is financial capital um and he significantly changed the way that uh that um that that uh that you know the global financial international order um he comes in under carter right and this is one thing to remember <laughs> you know carter carter sort of gets a pass nowadays for people uh but carter really was the the guy who opened up the gate um for neoliberalism right. uh, but anyways to, to do this quickly like volker comes in um and he dramastic drastically increases 
interest rates, right, which is essentially the price of money from the Federal Reserve, the price of money in the economy. Um, so all of the kind of loans that you take out, all of the interest that you pay, um, it's not directly like set to that, um, but it's it's set like downstream to it, right? Because that is the, the amount of interest that banks have to pay to the Federal Reserve to borrow money, right? So that all gets sort of kicked down to everybody else. So when you highly increase the, the Federal Reserve rates, that means that everybody is going to be paying much higher interest rates on all kinds of financial products, um, loans, et cetera, that, that, that we use. Um, so he drastically increases it to the, this rate. And what that meant is that you see a dramatic contraction um, in the economy. I mean, you have to understand, um, you know, and for people who aren't necessarily making these kind of decisions for businesses, understand the role that finance plays in just almost any kind of company. If you need to buy something at the beginning of a season, right? Like, let's say, I don't know, you, you rent boats out at the lake, right? And at the beginning of the season, you need to buy 15 boats. Typically, you borrow money. Um, to do that. So if you start to see a massive uh, increase in your interest rates, it, a lot of things that already are happening in the economy start to become unprofitable. And when they become unprofitable, they essentially die. So what happens with that is you see mass unemployment, you see people getting fired from their jobs, you see all this economic activity sort of grind to a halt. Um, and the people who get hit the worst with this is not the the bankers or the bosses or even the owners. It's the people at the very bottom of that, that society. So you see um, Volcker sort of put in this massive, what is called the Volcker shock that just punishes the working class across this country. You know, people, um, you know, uh, you know, you use this as an example to say like, well, this is why Carter loses um, and Reagan comes into power. And I don't know, getting into that is neither here nor there. But of course, people rightfully are going to react against the system and a government that they saw their life dramatically, um, you know, <laughs> decline under. Um, so that's what happens with, um, you know, the domestic economy and, and, you know, it really affects not only uh, working people, but it also privileges a certain kind of um, capitalists over another. Which ones? Financial capitalists. Because the people who now get to get paid interest um, from everybody else now are making more money than they were in the past. I mean, industrial capitalists, the people who actually, you know, invest in capital to produce things, um, they saw it much harder to operate. And all of the kind of stuff, when we talk about the great decline of American capitalism, industrial capitalism, Rust Belt towns, this is the process that kicks that off. It's not the only cause, but it was a major part of this, right? I don't have time to go through the in, in entire history, but it also has a huge effect on the global South um, because so many countries and uh, in organizations in that part of the world, you know, depend on American finance um, to, uh, <laughs> um, you know, to, to operate not just businesses, but governments. And you saw all these co countries facing massive debt crisis to try to service American debt. Um, and it basically created an international financial crisis that brought so many of these developing countries at a critical point in their development, basically begging um, for, you know, a, a American aid on top of American aid to basically pay back all the different uh, financiers. Um, and what ends up coming out of this uh, domestically in the United States is the rise of financial capital and not just American financial capital, but a kind of international financial capital that becomes based in the United States. Um, you know, we move past the system where the the gold dollar was the, you know, the basis of, of the economy and then it becomes fiat, right? Just was coming out of the United States, um, you know, full faith and credit of the United States government. Um, and and that creates a kind of problem for America as it's basically its currency is being utilized around the globe to sort of be, um, you know, the uh, the medium of account um, between different, uh, you know, international organizations. Um, well, how can you continue to have a system uh, that has some stability in the monetary system um, while um, moving away from a gold standard, trying to service all of these other countries' um, needs and responsibilities? Well. It's to create what is Jonas Varoufakis calls a debt recycling machine, um, and by basically convincing the glo global capitalist class to bring their money to Wall Street um, and to take advantage of those early high interest rates, um, 
you start to get an influx of money into the United States in this time, not money that's really trickling down to everybody else. Um, but basically, if you are a wealthy person around the globe, you want your money to be held in American banks, you want it to be held in American assets. Um, so it doesn't matter where you make your money from, it doesn't even have to be financial capital, that money is going to find its way um, into the American financial system, right? This creates a whole shift um, in, in not just American, but global capitalism. It is a moment where like industrial capitalists sort of get pushed back into second, you know, playing second fiddle. Not that they're, you know, a small player anymore, but like, you know, they basically lose out to a dominant um, financial capitalist um, class. Um, and all of this was done in the service of breaking labor domestically in the United States, breaking a growing working class movement in the U.S., um, and imposing um, an austerity neoliberal mindset on not just the American government, but governments around the globe, right? Um, this is a really important moment in American capitalism. Um, and so when we see inflation fears being brought up again, um, we should be very worried. I'll tell you right now, I don't see a future um, where they raise interest rates again so dramatically because uh, so much of the global financial system is dependent on these extremely, extremely low rates. I'm, for the most part, all of the growth in global capitalism um, is is very much attached to the fact that if you're a big enough organization, if you have access to capital, you can ex essentially get uh, cheap to free money from the U.S. government at this point. Um, so I don't necessarily know what the um, you know the Federal Reserve response to this kind of freak out will be. But I'll tell you right now, um, as we're, we're seeing um, from people like Tulsi um, and, oh, yeah. and you know, members of, of the United States government, that there is an attitude that we need to be uh, you know, cutting back social spending and the kind of extremely modest programs that we've seen over the past couple of years that have helped people, but they haven't helped people enough, are under fire. Um, can I put this up real quick to Tulsi? Absolutely. This is Tulsi, and you know, there's better clips of her talking specifically about inflation, but this is Tulsi in her post kind of politics uh, role on, on Fox News, telling them exactly what they want to hear. Here's the reality with the bill that they're I don't know why her head's so big. Forward, is that our government is <laughs> too powerful right and goes. too big, even as it is, and this bill is only going to make matters worse. Uh, the provisions in the bill are so vague that really it's going to be unelected bureaucrats who end up deciding how these provisions are implemented and no accountability. Uh, and, and really it'll empower them to be able to stick their noses into every aspect of our lives, furthering this this cradle to grave mentality of government dependence that makes us lose even more of our autonomy as we are paying for it. As government gets bigger, our wallets are getting smaller. The limbism with the cradle to grave stuff. I mean, that, um, excuse me, man, I don't know why I hit you. Censoring Matt again. Uh, don't you say anything bad about Rush. Um, great American. <laughs> but, um, no, I mean, uh, the fact is, is that the inflation talk that we're seeing right now is being used um, as, I don't know, as a way to sort of avoid um, politics. Because I'll tell you what, this would not be extremely popular right now saying we don't want to do uh, social programs in this country because we want to make sure that labor is as subservient as weak as possible. Right. That's not a winning message. But <laughs> that inflation, which people remember. And they've now been taught a kind of reflexive logic about it. Um, I mean, because look, look, I just told you all this stuff about about Volcker and what this moment in American history meant. Um, but a lot of people who lived through it um, would say will say something along the lines of it was bad, but it was what needed to be done. OK, yeah, I was going to say, like, if uh, if Giannis Varoufakis was uh, in uh, like sort of Freaky Friday into Jimmy Carter's shoes and Richard Nixon's shoes. What is there like a consensus response of what uh, like should have been done at that moment or could have been done? Well, the the problem with what you're seeing in, in that moment is the the consequences of of you know early globalization, right? And as jobs are starting to move overseas, um, it created a lot of problems domestically um, in, in the United States. And uh, you know, the, I mean, other solutions to this are doing massive investment in like key and strategic industries domestically, right? right. Which is something that the United States had very little interest in doing, not because they, they didn't care about American dynamism, um, but because the people who sort of were sitting at the top and have so, had sort of accumulated the power 
um, and control over society, um, you know, necessary, uh, you know, over those kind of key industries. I don't know. They were sitting pretty and they, they didn't really feel the need to see, find like a, uh, you know, government or socially owned uh, <laughs> competitor. Right. But I don't know. Yeah. I mean, like inflation is one of those things where it's like, I don't think it's, it's helpful to sit here and say like there is one quick, easy silver bullet to dealing with it. Um, but much like, you know, what we've been sort of noting with climate change, right? There is not one quick, easy solution to climate change either, is that it is a problem that governments are going to try to solve, right? But I'll tell you, and, um, and, you know, in the case of inflation, the way this government will deal with it is by immiserating working people, Um in the same way that dealing with climate change, you're going to see that kind of responsibility fall on the backs of American workers and American people, right? Like this is the kind of thing is that like dealing with these, uh, you know, these problems is extremely complex. Um, but the, there's if there's an easy um, way out that means sort of immiserating working people across the board, like they will follow that path. Right. Um, and that's why people should be worried. Like, I, I don't sit here right now and say I have a prediction of how this inflation thing is necessarily going to be mediated. I think in the short, short term, there's going to be pushback against social spending bills for sure. Um, I don't know what the, I can't tell you what the Federal Reserve um, response is going to be with much confidence. Um, but I just think it's something that people need to be paying attention to um, and, and watching closely and sort of having this kind of historical context and also kind of social political context to understand like one, this is not just some kind of random reaction and two, um, um, you know, these, these, uh, the, these systems don't necessarily have to fall on the back. Like the punishment of this does not necessarily have to fall on the back of working people. And the fact that we saw some minor increases in, in wages for working people does not necessarily mean um, that like the next result is mass unemployment and, and mass uninflation, right? Right. Anyway, we got to, I mean, um, that was fun. I haven't done like a gem. Like that. That's great. <laughs> I appreciate it. Um, I hope that was helpful. Well, we got a lot to get to in the post game. Um, we wanted to uh, actually, I want to shout out something real quick. Um, we we want to talk a little bit. I, I'm going to introduce Matt. I don't know if people saw, um, but over the break, there was a fascinating new uh, organization um, that tried to buy the United States Constitution. And failed pretty <laughs> dramatically. And now all these people who gave these kind of scammers money in the first place um, are, I don't know, unfortunately, I would say, I don't know. I've like, I feel bad for people who get swindled by these guys. Uh, even well, though I think. Yeah, look, I, I feel bad. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, 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 I kind of feel bad. But like the thing that bugs me about like the, the <laughs> Constitution thing, and mm -hmm. they, they also wanted to like buy a basketball team or buy a whole bunch of land in Wyoming. Is all this fetishization of decentralize this and decentralize that? But everything that they're going after is a rivalrous form of value, right? Like mm -hmm. you can't own multiple copies of this constitution. It's a rare one that you know. The whole point is it's rare. Land again, you can't like multiple people owning the same piece of land is not how it works, right? You can't. Uh, basketball teams are very valuable because it's a monopoly. <laughs> And you can't just start up your own basketball team and try to play, play your way into it, right? So it really bugs me when people can't do that simple analysis of like, do, am I really going after the decentralization in here, or is this just a fancy way to like buy a uh, uh, put my like like the star registry, mm -hmm. um, uh, any. Anyway, uh, my name on or own like a star or asteroid or something but anyway no, no i mean absolutely i mean it's it's extremely incredible that that's happening um with just like like i don't know like the star registry stuff is funny um uh, but you know people are spending 25 dollars and they're getting a certificate right right like, this is like extremely highly speculative activity and people are putting a lot of money into it um so i mean for sure like yeah man you shouldn't be getting bamboozled with this kind of stuff but i don't know a lot of people are just sort of try trying to figure out a way to make other people getting money and they want to be a part of the ride too i mean that's right. is, the trick right is this just a sign of like how little there is for to invest like a, there's not a like a East India company that you can just give this money to and have them go get you some profits, uh, you know, right? Like we're is this a is this basically a point? Does Bitcoin represent a point in capitalism? I guess is my open question. Mm -hmm. Like late the late capitalism is it crypto capitalism now where there's just nothing and we just have to pretend that we're making actual value somehow. 
So I'll be breaking that down for Matt. Um, plus, we'll be taking questions from the Discord. And this weekend, uh, we will also be doing releasing our Think Tank episode. So look out, patrons, for a post on that for people to suggest topics. Um, but before we go, I did want to do a quick shout out because there is some exciting stuff happening um, in the state of Rhode Island, a, a state where we have um, a few, many listeners actually um, live in a state that <laughs> I'm no have you been to Rhode Island? In, sorry. Have you been to Rhode Island? I have been to Rhode Island. Yeah. Yeah. Me a too. Times. It's, it's a beautiful state. Yeah. Um, and fascinating, strong, good folks. Like it's, I don't know. Um, I didn't know how strong the folks were, but uh, Newport was really nice. Um, my, uh, my, my grandfather was a sailor and he retired up in Rhode Island. Oh, interesting. So, uh, yeah, he was a Navy man. So like, I know a lot of the kind of, I have some connections with Rhode Island, actually. Uh, I've only been once or twice. Um, but, uh, you know, the sailors are tough folks and good folks. I'll speak for them. Right. I will not be saying the same thing for the vast majority of elected officials in Rhode Island, though. Um, a state that is just always amazing to me uh, how how corrupt and wicked a lot of the people um, <laughs> in politics are there. Um but I wanted to highlight a group that's trying to do something about that, and that's Uprise um, Rhode Island, and just specifically this action. So as a part of the American Rescue Plan, um, Rhode Island, uh, unfortunately, like uh, many other states, has refused to sort of use the money that was allocated to them from the federal government to deal with social programs. Um, and Rhode Island, like many other parts of the country, has a massive um, homelessness uh, crisis. Uh, so uh, State Senator Menendez, sorry, Mendez, um, has been doing this action, and I believe there was a rally when we were live today, so I don't know how that went, um, but people in the area should check it out. If you see there, the weather is 33 degrees, um, and Senator um, Mendez has been sleeping outside a tent outside of the state house until leadership acts on the homelessness crisis. Uh, we're in a crisis, and there are hundreds of folks who are unhoused, and we're out here because we want to make sure no one freezes to death. Um, the cross breeze on Smith Hill was steady and cutting as tets were set up um, and supplies carried in from cars by supporters tonight. Over 600 Rhode Islanders at the last count uprise Rhode Island has will be sleeping in tents, cars under bridges inside abandoned buildings, doorways or any number of other places deemed unfit for human habitation. Um, so this is a really critical fight to make sure that some of this social money goes to dealing with social programs um, and making sure that people can be housed. Um, um, Matt Brown, who is going to be running for governor, as a, uh, I believe as a member of the Uprise uh, Rhode Island uh, slate, um, along with uh, Mendez, um, um, has also been there um, showing up and here's some you know clips of people. Um, night two just started. The 50 people joined them nice. in support, uh, and 12 are staying the night. Um, so, again, if you're in the Rhode Island area, um, this is something to definitely uh, check out and participate in. Um, before we went live, and I wasn't able to get uh, too, too much information, but this morning in response to this, um, Rhode Island has approved $31 million for affordable housing um, and, and preserving more than 600 units. Um, but as this person says, said another way after nine months, the McKee administration is finally allocating money approved by voters in March to help with the biggest crisis outside of COVID facing Rhode Islanders. Um, so the fight is nowhere near over. Um, but wanted to shout out some kind of, uh, you know, a, a positive movement and, and people who are trying to take things into their own hands. So shout out there and bring back, bring back to a classic TMBS. Yeah, hours. damn. <laughs> shout out, shout out. We'll have to throw people in the pyramid or, or in the gulag. <laughs> <laughs> in the post game, maybe. <laughs> pyramid, that's a throwback. That's Only a, the old heads will remember that one. Yeah. Um, well, that never really made a whole lot of sense, but it was... Just a Ben Carson it joke. for good memes. <laughs> it did. Yeah, it was way more funny, actually. I never understood it because I think it originated on MR. But... Well, it, yeah, it was a Ben Carson um, pyramids were made to store grain thing. Oh, and... Is that really where it was from? Yeah. <laughs> That's so funny. I miss Dr. Right. Ben. You yeah, know, you know, I... well, I was just going to say, Dr. Ben, like, he kept his head down and served a full term of the Trump administration didn't really have a <laughs> yeah, hell of a lot of damage <laughs> he had well they're exactly right like he did like he was like you thought he'd be one of the bumbling fools that was constantly making like faux pas and getting in the news and not able to actually like cause damage but no he like 
he was a good soldier for like the worst people on earth um and didn't like let his weird sort of eccentricities get in the way of that which um i guess is a model for some people i remember during that that campaign being with somebody down here and you know they were they were republican obviously and they were just sort of talking and they just kept on it was like before, it was like sort of early in the primary and i knew who ben carson was at this point um but the guy kept on re- referring to him as dr ben in a way you know and he was like he wasn't like saying like do you support him or like i find him interesting you know it just seems like well you know as dr ben always says it just like quoting him <laughs> randomly around me it's like who the fuck is this dr ben that this guy's obsessed with and little did i know um he was about yeah. to become a, a vehicle for reaction and also incredible incredible um theories about the pyramids and i mean i don't know man maybe we should do some in the post game let's we should do some 2015 uh look back <laughs> at those guys because they were funny <laughs> it was great the whole like interrogating ben carson's uh you know fabulous claims about his life growing up where like he deflected a knife with his belt buckle and uh said actually i think you want to uh uh hold up the other person that was like his heroic story of uh, at some fast food restaurant of not getting held up like he, he the thing about ben oh, is yeah, like when he would try to skip the people he came up with the plan to save popeyes from uh well, and that's the thing about Dude, Ben. Yeah, he just like he just goes with it in a way that like you're empowered to. I think when like I, w- this reminds me of, like being at like youth group growing up, and there's certain people that just lie about stuff. There's the yeah. type of people that would also like do like the speaking in tongues during uh, the youth mass, something like that's like come on, let's relax a little bit about that. Um, but they did Dude, like people just, get bullied for that after. The- I saw somebody really roasting people on Twitter recently, but at the time, no, like people just like went to school and like, I, I think there was like a critical mass of like certain popular kids that would do it. And, uh, and people just acted like, I guess that's the thing that you could do. Like, I mean, I said, you know, I I always said, you know, I I read the Bible to meet girls. Uh, (laughs) So, you know, it's not too far from where I was at, but that's the way it's, um, I don't know. Maybe we should, we should save some of this uh, for post game, and uh, people should definitely join us up there. I really appreciate all of um, our patrons. You know, as typically happens at the end of the month, uh, we get pretty hit pretty hard uh, with losses. So, um, you know, if people have been interested in supporting this show and this project, right now is definitely a great time to sign up. We have a pretty full December coming up for folks, actually. So, um, so definitely be a lot that you're going to want to catch and also help us get to uh, a thousand. We dipped below 800, I mean, 900 again. So we got a little ways to go, but let's get Matt's ass up uh, down to Texas. <laughs> get, uh, get some uh, big cowboy boots when I'm down there. There we go. Or, or a hat. Right, we'll see. I got, I got five on the wall behind me right now. We do have the problem. Um, <laughs> All right, y'all. See y'all in in a little bit in the postgame, probably 15, 20 minutes. Peace out.